panel here uh, with uh, me again, Lowell Francis. Uh, I was uh, uh, offered the topic role playing in the digital age, which seemed to me the most uh, vague uh, uh, thematic <laughs> that we could get. And uh, so we're going to kind of try and piece together uh, a narrative, a story uh, from that. Uh, today I have with me uh, uh, a couple of, of speakers. Uh, first, uh, I have Andrew Gunner, uh, who is uh, uh, also known as Master Geek on RPG Geek. Uh, he's a blogger uh, from time to time. He's done video blogs as well, uh, something I haven't touched. Uh, he's also a co-host with me of the Play on Target uh, podcast. And uh, he's also uh, has conducted a, a successful Kickstarter for his Time Heroes uh, game, uh, which is experience I hope he'll uh, uh, talk about and how that fits in. And then uh, Steve Sigety is with us as well. He's a, a blogger at uh, Kaijuville. Uh, he has interests in uh, a number of uh, uh, cinemas, uh, Hammer Horror, <laughs> uh, Kaiju, uh, and uh, uh, also Shaw Brothers, and uh, I tend to uh, uh, turn to his advice on those topics. Uh, but Steve's also uh, has a background in information science and is a librarian. And I hope that he can give us some some insights from that direction. Uh, and I have sort of what I was occurred to me as I was thinking about this, and you can can tell me what you guys think. Um, I remember uh, years ago when Macintoshes first came out, and uh, then when uh, well, we started to see the possibilities of laptops talking at the game table about, oh my god, can you imagine <laughs> what it's going to be like when we can get computers at the table, when we can finally have those, how that's going to just make everything so awesome. Hmm. Um, and I, I, I don't think that promise has been delivered on. Um, <laughs> Not not necessarily the tools aren't there, but perhaps I didn't think through the unintended consequences uh, of such such devices. Um, but we are here, 21st century digital age in a hobby that started very much non-digital, um, you know, uh, tactile from the miniatures world. Uh, you know, we've the early stuff has evidence of all that cut and paste by hand. Uh, pressmanship and so on. So there, it is interesting to look at those as as real uh, artifacts. Um, so I will ask you guys, uh, and I'll uh, I probably start with with uh, Steve here. Uh, w what do you see as the most interesting or important change here that that the digital age has brought to role playing? I think the most important change is probably communication. Um, back in the day that you mentioned, uh, it probably took weeks, months, even years uh, for people to collaborate. Uh, they might have been collaborating through fanzines that were hand circulated or, or sent out by mail uh, through uh, the magazines of the time, Dragon, uh, What Else Challenge, uh, Journal of the Traveler's Aid Society. Uh, so working through uh, something that you were you were doing for your game, uh, you might have to wait for next month's issue, or if if you are pub a publisher and you are putting out new material, uh, your fans have to wait another month for that. Uh, so I think the almost instantaneous communication that we have now it might be the most important thing in my mind, with blogs, forum posts, uh, hangouts, uh, social media. People can work on their projects and get real-time feedback from other players following game designers and, and getting suggestions from game designers that they look up to. Uh, so I think communication is really tremendous right now and worldwide. We can talk to someone on the other side of the planet same way that we talk to someone across the room. So uh, it just makes for better collaboration for everyone. Okay. Uh, Andrew, what would you see? You know, I, I think I would actually that, that was what I was going to go with was was communication, uh -oh. but le <laughs> less so on the on the uh, ability to collaborate side and more on the propagation of um, not just role playing games, but on the geek subculture as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. It's it, it allows us to you know connect a lot easier, more easily with um, other players, other people that share our hobby. It lets other people know that 
I mean, I remember when I was a kid, you know, growing up on ever scouting the role playing game, it was it was a pain for me to get a group together. I always felt like an outcast because I was the geek and growing up in high school without computers and things like that. You know, the geeks were the outcasts. And as as we're now getting into Facebook and social media and blogging and through the Hangouts, through RPG Geek sites like that, we are able to not only come together more as a, an actual subculture and not have to, you know, feel like the freaks or the outsiders, but I think it's also a way to spread it to other people. Um, you know, people who might not know that it exists, um, who might just happen to see a, a Facebook status or or a note here or uh, happen to stumble across a blog that they're like, hey, this is something I'm interested in and just draws in a whole new um, like generation of, of role players. Well, you know, uh, I'm going to tangent here. So one of the things we've certainly seen is uh, uh, for example, Geek and, and, and Sundry and Will Wheaton's Tabletop, uh, they have done, I think, Dragon Age they've done, and did they do Fiasco as well? They did yes, Fiasco. Yeah, they did Fiasco yeah. so, uh, so two, one, uh, uh, a game that's fairly traditional, um, uh, and another that's, that's, that's completely non-traditional. Um, so we've seen that as a positive media. But let me ask you, would you say that the depictions of our particular geek subculture, um, has there been a shift in that for the better or for worse? I mean, what would you see as the perception of that in a digital age where we can get broadcasts and people can get lots of information streams on that? Is it is it easier to be a, a, a geek uh, or particularly a role-playing geek? I... Hmm... I would say yes, probably overall. Um, I do think there are, as as the geek culture is expanding and becoming more socially acceptable, um, there's the less positive uh, depictions of it, which I won't necessarily get into here, but there are a couple of shows on television that surround geeks that I don't think actually cast us in a favorable light, even though they're supposed to. But um, in, in general, I would say yes. I think, I think knowing that there's other people out there that you can connect with at the push of a button makes it a lot easier to be open and uh, to feel like you're accepted, um, if not necessarily with the culture as a whole, uh, although I think it is, at, at least you know there's other people with your similar interests that you can just you know contact with a few moments notice. Although, as as Steve was saying earlier, without having to wait weeks to um, whether it's through letters or fanzines or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, Steve. Yeah, Andrew, I, I think you you made a good point too earlier about getting groups together, because it, in some ways you can just put out a call on social media, building up uh, a group that way uh, to find out if there's somebody, uh, well, in your town, for example, with meetup.com. I, I think it's meetup.com. Yeah, it's meetup, yep. Uh, and, but also uh, you could put out a call on G+, and get a hangout together. And yep, you have people absolutely. there again from, from all over uh, to get a group together. Uh, and uh, uh, we're joined here uh, by uh, Megway Baker, uh, uh, who uh, a game designer, independent publisher, um, uh, Thousand and One Nights, Psy Run, Valiant Girls, uh, active on Twitter and G Plus, uh, and also contributes to Gaming as Women. Uh, uh, Megway, this is uh, Steve Sigety uh, and Hi. Andrew Gunner. Hi, Steve. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Um, Sorry to be late. We're sort of generally batting around the topic, um, and uh, I'll immediately hit you with uh, the, the sort of the big question here. What do you see as the most important impact of the sort of the new digital age on role playing? Okay. Um, wow. Biggest input. <laughs> Well, what are we doing right now? This, this, I think, right now, what we're doing is the biggest impact of um, digital, digital age on role-playing. That I can play games via G Plus Hangouts with people anywhere in the world as long as we can sync up the time zones. And um, there's lots of other really cool, cool stuff happening in digital gaming, whether it's you know, uh, things like um, uh, view screen uh, that Chandler did, or you know, roll tw uh, the Roll20 stuff, and all the various technological assists that people are using um, support gaming is fantastic. But the single most um, game-changing part of technology, part of digital age gaming, is this right here. 
Skype was the predecessor, predecessor but uh, G Plus Hangouts is astonishing. Um, <laughs> There you go. That's the short answer. No, no, and that's I think that's that's fair to say. Um, uh, let me let me ask you. Uh, 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 I want to take a uh, a concept I've been hearing about from another piece of fandom and ask you whether you think it applies to uh, our role playing. Uh, one of the things is uh, uh, I've written for comic books. I follow comic book fandoms and stuff. And uh, every month we see uh, a, a tempest arise. Uh, when DC does something stupid um, or other companies, um, but uh, and uh, arguments about that and back and forth and wrangling and a lot of negative responses. Um, there was a lot of hubbub about their uh, exploitation of the Watchmen property, for example, uh, discussions like that. What is interesting is hearing from comic book retailers. Um, Judging by sort of the talk in the comic blogosphere, you would think that everyone hates these companies. Hmm. But when you talk to the retailers, the retailers say that those discussions have almost no impact on the buying habits of the people, on the kinds of discussions that are actually going on in the game stores and, and things like that, that it's, it's very much confined to a very narrow uh, niche group. Now we see a lot of arguments and discussions on on G plus and RPG net and even RPG geek and, and all the other places EN world and things. Is it your impression that those actually have a, an impact on what goes on sort of in the gaming, publishing, buying uh, uh, world, more or less? There are definitely people who are listening. I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did everybody would, else answer this already? No, no. This is the this is the, the first time I brought this out. <laughs> okay. I, I would say one one thing that um, sometimes I I tend to forget is that even though I try to be tuned into what's happening uh, in the RPG world, uh, following designers and um, being active on on G Plus, for example, is there are so many other gamers who do not do that, who who you know buy their books at the local, uh, friendly local game store, but don't have any sort of digital presence. And they're, they're playing just fine, buying the books. Uh, so I think it's that same way that you mentioned with the comic retailers, too, seeing that. Mm -hmm. That sometimes maybe what, uh, what we might be talking about really isn't even on those other groups' radar. OK. Andrew? Yeah, I think there's probably a Venn diagram that you can make. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Well, um, when it when it comes to you know the the problems and and issues getting getting uh, uh, more prevalent with a with a uh, digital uh, um, as as it is now, um, I think that that that's probably one, actually one of the probably one of the downsides I would say of 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 it is that it's kind of it's. People tend to be overly negative on the internet and not as positive. So I think that a lot of those, a lot of those negatives, like the problems you said, you know, with, with DC or with certain um, game designers now and then, I, I think the, the 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 negatives are what are getting all of the media attention. And with us, us being such an inclusive culture, it just keeps getting passed around and around and around and around and around and kind of maybe even growing worse than it actually was to begin with. And like a giant game of internet telephone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, when you when you don't have such a digital presence, you can just happily go into the friendly local game store, pick up your game, and as Steve said, sit down and play it, mm -hmm. and you don't have to worry about any of the the venom that may or may not <laughs> accurately be being passed thrown on the internet. Okay. Uh, well, I, 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 it, it's interesting to me because we've certainly seen uh, an attempt by, let's take for example the the big, uh, you know, the elephant in the room is Watsi's. D and D next. Mm -hmm. That's um, uh, that's an attempt to to seize on that community to to use it. Whether that's a legit, I don't want to say legitimate. Um, <laughs> certainly, there are some people that don't believe that 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 uh, they are really trying to to crowdsource that. Um, and other people, you know, there are a lot of different perspectives on that. But that's that's an attempt to 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 tune into that and. And get some some utility out of that. Um, right. 
uh, and certainly with Kickstarter, uh, we're seeing um, more responsiveness. Essentially, the, the companies are, are are having to have a certain degree of transparency. Again, small fish, but being responsive to to that. Um, and now, Megway, did you have you been involved in Kickstarter projects as well? Um, I have, and I do. I just have to say, I have a little. Um, YouTube video on the, how to pronounce my name. It's oh, Megay. Megay, um, sorry. And you, and <laughs> Meg I is fine. Last time. <laughs> okay. um, I have part of Kickstarter, uh, Kickstarter things, um, and definitely I think that there's a, a space where the conversation around Kickstarters and the conversation around oh new like new Kickstarter, that's a specific circle of buzz and circle of awareness. Uh, there's some crossover and points of contact between you know, G Plus and Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Pinterest and Reddit and Tumblr and whatever. Um, not a, and uh, I don't know very many people who can be active in all those places and actually play a game <laughs> after you take right. care of your social media all day. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah. There's there's. I, it sounds like there's a little. I think I'm missing the question a little, like specifically around Kickstarter. Oh well, I, I guess I was going to ask what your impression was of of how uh, did you feel that that the the community was supportive, or that there was a, a back and forth in the Kickstarter process, or is it very much kind of putting things out there and then just kind of uh, patching things? What what's your sense of how that taps well, in? So I've been I've been personally involved in a couple Kickstarters, and I've definitely been involved in the sort of support crew watching very closely several Kickstarters. Um, my own my own crowdfunding experience has been totally positive. I crowd I crowdfunded the second edition Thousand One Nights through Indiegogo, which is flexible funding, and that's why I did it. I did that in a way where I had the product completely done, I knew what I was doing, I set reasonable goals, all those things happened. I have seen, and we've all seen, Kickstarter disasters, where it's the the flip side of the connectivity, where there's like all this buzz, I'm like, oh, I've, I've got to get a Kickstarter, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do levels, and I've got t-shirts, i got to make t-shirts, and it's... It, there's no game there, or there's very little game there, or there isn't a community, there isn't support. That can be really hard to watch. It's like the modern version of a, um, a heartbreaker. Um, <laughs> was putting so much energy into your Kickstarter campaign, but you haven't read the game yet. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andrew, when you did your Kickstarter, do you, did you feel that there was a, a back and forth with the community, or is it? What was your sense of that? Um, I mean, my 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 experience with Time Heroes was was also extremely positive, pretty much across the board. Um, it was. Uh, I, don't know, I I also was one who had my product done. Um, I you know I didn't have the art or anything done, but I had I had the main text finished before I even started writing up the Kickstarter. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, I'm just gonna throw out there right now is like what I would recommend for anyone who is not a big name uh, RPG mm -hmm. designer who is interested in going to Kickstarter. The rules should be have at least a solid draft of your of your game written before you do the Kickstarter. Have a couple of very achievable stretch goals. Don't go crazy and don't worry about a ton of extras unless you are mm -hmm. gonna be able to do them yourself or get them done very easily. Um, that I think I think a lot of where the, uh, the the issues I've seen with some of the Kickstarters that have crashed has come in is overextending yourself beyond what you are actually capable of doing, just in the hopes that you'll get draw more interest in your Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is you don't need the interest, and in, you, you you don't, especially for the little guy like myself, you don't want the interest and in all the little extras you're throwing out there. You want to draw the interest in your core book, which is what you should have solidly finished to initially get the something going anyway. So. Okay. Right. Um. Let me. Let me shift the track a little bit, Steve. Before we started, uh, um, you were talking about that you had had recently sat in and had seen some new stuff on on information technologies. And uh, uh, as a person who works with that and works with library science, um, what would you see as as interesting new possibilities or or directions that that might head in? 
Well, one of the things that we talked about was LiFi, which I was not familiar with at all, which is basically instead of using uh, radio signals for wireless, it uses light as a source of transmission. Hmm. So, uh, which is really curious. Um, it looks like mostly one of the biggest um, uses for that might be for traffic, for, for uh, guiding traffic and uh, car traffic signals and such. But uh, what that would should do is be much faster. And I, I'm thinking that that will help with things like Google Hangouts, where um, instead of having uh, a lot of dropouts, people have to drop out of their, their, their hangout and not be able to play because of network issues. Maybe something like that where we have some faster speeds, um, more fiber optic connections. We'll have uh, a better backbone, better connection possibilities uh, for keeping these games going and, and have everyone, everyone uh, on the same page with that. Now, I have heard, and, and again, this is secondhand, and I'm certainly a liberal arts person and not a, a tech person, but uh, there was discussion recently on uh, extra credits, the sort of video game and game design web series that's associated with Penny Arcade, right. um, where they talked about there is a bandwidth cap. There mm -hmm. is kind of an absolute limit for information bandwidth, and that that we we can see that that is actually coming up in the near future. Sure, uh, is that is that is that correct? Is, you. I haven't looked into that uh, very much at all, actually. Okay. Uh, but but that will be something that I, I will look into. Okay, get uh, on that, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Make that happen. I'll start, I'll start <laughs> furiously <laughs> typing here and check. Uh, no, that, that that does make sense, though. We, we have um, you know, physical limits to the, the infrastructure that we have right now. So what will be the next thing? What... Uh, What's on the horizon for that? That's that's certainly a, a valid topic for sure. Okay. Um, have you guys uh, heard about this? And I'll, uh, I just saw this on various blogs this week. Um, this future of storytelling uh, online course. Have you seen that? I'm very excited about that course. Um, oh. I signed up for it, and I am looking forward to seeing what happens. Awesome, um, uh, I and, and I hope you'll you'll update on on G plus because I, 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 sure. I it, it looks it looks pretty amazing and uh, uh, I will put in a, a link to this in the uh, description afterwards. I, I mean it's it's eight weeks of a free online international course, um, and again in a field I never thought we'd have have access to actually talking mm -hmm. about storytelling as a as a field and in particular. Uh, talking about storytelling as it relates to, to gaming, you know, is a, is a distinct subsection there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I, I love the new world. It's it, <laughs> it's crazy, full of full of problems. <laughs> it's full of awesome problem, awesome cool stuff, also weird problems. I'm having a G plus blackout screen. Oh, oh is it did it give you the the blank on that? Yes. <laughs> anyway, so I can we, see we, all your smiling faces behind me, but I wanted to say about this about storytelling and the digital age and like the way that we are now able to hear stories we couldn't hear before and tell stories we couldn't hear before um, because of new media um, is it's just astonishingly cool. Um, I had a lot of history in back of uh, in my back of doing oral history work and doing material culture work and the way that people are telling stories now by blogs or by um, playing games over G plus or doing a live tweet like w watching people live tweet the game that they're playing <laughs> that's cool and wacky and <laughs> could not have happened and I think back to God, 20 years ago when there were a gaming group that I was part of was uh, audio recording game sessions on a multi-track with mics over and then some pe people would do complicated things to compile an accurate digital record. And now you just click record on your little iPod phone device thing and there you go, digital record. Yeah, it's astonishing. 
something that I never never really imagined happening is like. Um, for example, with the game that I'm playing in with Lowell right now, the the Changeling game, and a couple of the games that I've run over G Plus Hangouts, I'll go and check things out later after they've been, um, you know, recorded and put on YouTube or whatever. And holy crap, people are watching, like enjoying watching us <laughs> role play. <laughs> yeah, that it's never weird. Imagine happening is like people just watching and enjoying the show. It's it's become so, a spectator sport. Yes. <laughs> Which is an interesting point because when it becomes a spectator sport, what changes? You know, what changes about it? If we're sitting and, as we mentioned earlier, like the response, like with comic books and how reaction to something that shows up in a comic book can or cannot change the culture around what shows up in other comic books and why people are talking about DC and Marvel and blah, blah, blah. The same thing happens in gaming. And if we, if it's just the four of us sitting around, we might say or do stuff, humor might go places, or we might do really serious things that we all understand the context for. But what if the four of us are playing a game and there's an unknown number of people who are watching this? <laughs> what is that going to do and how is that going to change how we portray those characters or make decisions in that moment and then how does that change if it's something that we're just recording now and then it's shown later you know there's there's a lot more levels of decision making and a lot more levels of self-awareness and reflection and it becomes very interesting and complex because you're right people are watching actual play videos of other people playing games Role-playing games, certainly, but also walkthroughs on um, video games. That's yeah. huge. My 13-year-old yeah. son watches several, like mostly like the whole Yogg's cast, Minecraft, Milieu, mm -hmm. is his, um, you know, stuff that he just watches, and he loves it, and it's, okay, this is cool. And I wonder where we're going with role-playing with that, because there's a lot we can observe and learn and enjoy, but there's also, you know... I want there becomes a place of like, all right, let's just play, just us. Yep. To, mm -hmm. to balance that out. I, I, I do know when I'm broadcasting, I, uh, I I'm I'm usually pretty tame with my language anyway. But like when I when I'm broadcasting and not just doing it for my own group's benefit, if we're playing something on G Plus Hangouts, I definitely, since I realize that people are watching, have caught myself editing things here and there. <laughs> I'm to try not to say something that could be taken the wrong way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, there's there's definitely from between the, the group that I run and record and the, the group that I've run and haven't recorded, there's definitely a, a major difference in in tone. And the group I run for that I don't record, there, there's a reason I don't record them. Um, and, uh, but but I have to wonder, you know, you, you mentioned uh, your 13 year old. Uh, yeah. How much? Uh, of this, can we see is is maybe going to be uh, a generational effect, where a generation that has been a more comfortable with the digital tools, but b also more used to exposing themselves mm -hmm. uh, digitally, um, what what impact that might have? Um, uh, and I, I uh, Steve, you work with college students a lot. Um, what's your sense right. of of their reaction? Uh, well. Um for things like uh, Facebook and social media and such, uh, there probably is a lower expectation of privacy, uh, that much more of their life is out there for, if not their own circles of friends, but public, public consumption. Uh, so there, there is that lower level of privacy, and that would probably feed into uh, how they would play an online game, for example. Um, but yeah, that that's... That's very interesting. That gets into a lot of different areas as far as um, there's just general privacy on the web, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Certainly my, my niece uh, grew up in a very internet light household. Um, they had almost no internet connection. Uh, but now that she's gone off to college, um, I see her on Facebook uh, a lot um, and posting things that I'm like, oh my gosh. Uh, you know, <laughs> and and it's almost all political stuff that would drive her dad, uh, and and a, a good deal of the the conservative wing of her particular uh, branch of the family, uh, insane. Uh, and 
and I'm always struck that she's that she's willing to do that in a way where I tend to be pretty, you know, I hold back. I don't I don't try to try to rock the boat uh, on that. <laughs> um, uh, so it, it, it it's I do find that very striking that 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 people who I normally wouldn't be expect to be confrontational. Uh, are perhaps a little more a active and confrontational on online. Well, it also might be her age. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I think a lot of that too, though, is like I, I for one, was. I mean, I, I've I was raised under the old adage of you know one of the things you don't talk about in public is religion and politics. Yeah. And for me, having been brought up with that prior to the internet age, that just kind of carries over. But the kids now that are growing up that didn't you know weren't around really before the internet that's just part of their their culture now you know they're just so much more open and they're just like you know whatever just vomit whatever out onto facebook that they're feeling at the moment they don't think twice about it because that's, that's just what they were raised with it's you know it's always been there they've never had life prior to it right. yeah I, I think i think Move it's on. um i think it very much uh uh what andrew just said it like there's people who are growing up now. My my seven year old doesn't remember before there were iPads. You know, it's crazy. I got we got our first computer when I was a sophomore in high school, and it was a Mac SE with the dual floppy drives, and you had to switch things out. You know, it's a different world. Right. But I also think that um, personal temperament has a lot to do with that. And I see. I definitely think that there's there's I. I'm a, Pretty involved with a lot of teenagers. We had six teenagers here for a gaming group today. I know a lot of teens, and some of them are very much in that space of Facebook nonstop, and others of them just are not. That's the way everybody is. I think working toward working with my my own teenagers, saying, you know, people are emailing you trying to set up a game. You might want to check your email sometime this week. <laughs> um, <laughs> Right. It's a new concept, and you know, I, my oldest is seventeen. He said, oh, oh, right. I, email, right. <laughs> so, uh, but I think that it's, I think like, um, like Lowell said about not, you know, not being, about having modest language. There's, there's all kinds of personal uh, ways that you go. You know, sometimes you, sometimes there's one end of the spectrum, one end of the other. But the truth is, and I think this is hard for parents, especially you know parents who grew up before the internet and went to high school before the internet. One of the things that I think is hard for us is to reconcile the two truths of uh, wanting to keep our children safe and teach, give them good internet skills as we give them other, like, you know, financial literacy, actual literacy, you know, making sure you know how to, life, you know, all the life skills stretches to how do you behave in the public forum of the internet. So that's true. Also true is that this is their world. And we have no find no actual long-term control over it. There will be crazy things that are developed in 20 years that we don't even know about yet. And they will be right up there with it. And they don't, like, it will be a big thing to them. Even though it freaks me out sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so. True. Uh, I, I, let me kind of follow up on that. You know, there is another dimension. There's a, there's a tactile dimension to to this beyond the sort of privacy and, and mm -hmm. Self-monitoring stuff is. Uh, I mean, I do enjoy playing and running uh, on online, but uh, it does, as a GM, significantly change my toolkit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, and and I I will say, I'm I'm a person who stands up. I'm a person who makes faces uh, when I run. There's a, a, a those sets of tools that don't work particularly well when I run. Online um, mm -hmm. and that, uh, that. What's your impression of how just that act of being in a digital space shapes shapes the RP experience? I'm uh, right there with you. Like it is driving me crazy that there's this little black box and I can't see my own face and I don't even know if you guys can see my face. Um, tell me if you can or not. Are you getting yes, a black we box? Yeah, we can, no, see, we you. can see you. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Because I agree completely with what you just said, Lowell, that there's, 
it's wonderful that I can be part of this conversation with you guys, that we can do this from wherever we are in the world, that we can play over G Plus Hangouts. There's a very different sensation to playing with people in the room. Um, and I don't think that that will ever go away, even though we all might be involved in great online games. I suspect we're going to still want to game in person with other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm a very animated GM. I mean, I, like Lowell said, I like to I like to make faces. I like to speak really quietly and then smash down on the table to scare the crap out of my players. You know, on a handout. So like, and I mean, a lot of that stuff, yeah, I can do it online. But I'll tell you, with my some of my like design skills, it's like 15 mm. times hard times harder to plan an adventure that I know I'm going to be running on G plus than mm. one I'm going to run the same adventure with my tabletop group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, and and to give a, a concrete example, I mean. For me, uh, I love I love superheroes, and and uh, you know I have uh, one shelf. Steve can attest to is uh, all the, <laughs> the the discount hero clicks that yes. we have. We run that, yeah. and we've got the playing mat and all that stuff. It's it's super fun, and I've run mutants and masterminds online for a group now about thirty some sessions um, using roll twenty, um, and that is is a hell of a lot of work. Hmm. It, it is because I, it, if we're going to have a fight, I want a map. And I don't want to just draw a map. I'll go and get a map. Okay, well, now I've got to get a map, and I've got to size it, and I've got to kind of figure out. And I'm not going to use hexes, so I'm going to use zones. So now I've got to draw in the zones. Well, and if I'm going to do that, I need to have tokens. And now i got to go track <laughs> down the art assets um, right. and get those. And I have hmm. to, to seriously limit myself, because I'm a very light prep guy, but I end up spending each session at least two hours doing that, and that is that is much more work <laughs> than, than if I had been doing it at the table. Um, yeah. And, it, and, and it's fun, and it looks good, and the players, oh, the players love it. it, it the, the problem is is that the payback is so good on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, if, if I weren't getting the payback, I could yeah. I could skip it I could cut it but it pays off but but it's so drastically different from my other approaches to, to running right yeah. that's one area where we might see you know as as tech develops you know more uh, more robust virtual tabletops where maybe you mm -hmm. might put in just um, a seed for something and it will auto generate uh, an area that's acceptable and then maybe some slight editing that you might need to do, um, mm -hmm. but but as those and even you know more so some of the 3D tabletops too, where it's it's even uh, there's a, a Kickstarter I think for for a virtual tabletop that's that's a more 3D view. Uh, yeah, of, I just saw that. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. a virtual virtual tabletop I think is the mm -hmm. name of it. But but as the tech develops like that, we we'll, we might see uh, something even more. More robust come along, and and it, it may uh, lessen the sort of prep time that's needed right now. But the, the the thing that we need to have is more robust, but also easier easier tools. Uh, right. I mean, I love Roll Twenty. I, I think it's uh -huh. I think it's it's brilliantly put together. I like Tabletop Forge. Roll Twenty works for me as as a kind of an idiot. Um, I can do it. I can work with it, and so on. Um, but then I'll see updates about, oh yeah, now we've got dynamic lighting and pathing that you can put in, and you can program mm -hmm. such that the tokens go, and you can have an instant. I'm like, no, no, I cannot. Um, and and I wonder, there must be people doing that and that, using yeah. those oh, yeah. tools. Uh, I, I don't understand. <laughs> on, on the on the flip side of that same subject too, though, I think that yes, I, I do think that the tech is going to develop, but I also think that's one of the reasons a lot of the lighter prep, more freeform games um, are starting to explode really well right now is because mm -hmm. like you know, Fate Core, Fate Accelerated, even Fiasco games like that, mm -hmm. it's next to nothing that you have to worry about having up on. You know, you don't have to worry about the battle maps. You don't have to worry about finding minis right. or things for everybody. Um, someone designed a great fake core uh, G plus hangout backdrop that basically has tokens. It has places to put aspects, and that's all you need for a game. And I think I think mm -hmm. um, in addition to the tech developing, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of these more freeform games coming out that are just more easily adaptable to the online gaming um, community than uh, some of the heavier crunch games that are coming out that maybe are going to be a little harder to adapt. Yeah, yeah. Right. I run into that a little bit with my games because. 
uh, Lola, you're talking about your hero clicks, and the Thousand One Nights and Cyrus is a is sorry, the Thousand One Nights is very environmental. You know, everything about that design is like play in this space, have food together, have music. I people have asked, could I run it over um, G Plus? And I have no, I was like, I have no idea how how would I do that? It's such a tactile, visual, sensual game. I haven't figured it out. Maybe I could. Maybe we'll just agree to all get the same snacks. I don't know. <laughs> but um, with Cyrun, some a couple people have actually, and I was on a. Uh, I'll, I'll track it down eventually. Uh, some people have figured out uh, how to generate a couple G plus or Google Google documents to run Cyrun, which is a super fast you know pick it up run it sort of thing. But it's very interesting and strange to me to watch because it's different, and I'm not designing yet. Like the, I'm not quite in the space where I'm designing yet for playing new media. Um, it's interesting. Siren the Pursuit is for, is for designed for new media, but it's still not designed for G Plus Hangouts. That's for playing in G Plus mm -hmm. Threads. Um, and I think that what Andrew's saying, you know, is is a precursor to the next phase of design where people are taking that sort of uh, possible play space into consideration. What, is, what do we want? How do we want this to integrate into playing over G plus Hangouts, um, playing with Roll20, playing with Tabletop Forge, playing with other new things that are coming out um, that are, are possible? Because everything, one thing we do know is everything gets turned into games and game design. <laughs> you know, that is true. Yeah. Go back through the archaeological record. If you see little tokens, they are probably not religious artifacts. They are <laughs> probably game pieces. <laughs> true thing. Um, so I'm really excited about that aspect of um, gaming digital age for sure. Because the next, uh, we're we're like right at the edge. You know, I think we're just about to start seeing amazing new game design. Um, and the one, the two that come right to mind is view screen. You know, Ralph Chandler's, um, Raphael Chandler's view screen game, and um, Gone Home. And I know that Gone Home is a video game, it's a straight up video game, but it has components of, uh, it, it, it's, it's a different type of interaction with media than we've mm -hmm. seen before. So, mm -hmm. well, cool. and it, it does it does bring up the question is, is uh, then we're seeing, actually I saw a lot of this discussion this last year in the G Plus streams uh, about people combining video games and or free-to-play games with augmented reality games mm -hmm. and and I, I wonder when someone's going to figure out a way to fuse that with LARPing um, yeah. in, in a useful and significant way. Yeah, and, and also with um, augmented fiction. Uh, one of the first Kickstarters I saw before there was even before I was seeing role-playing game designers discover Kickstarter was for an augmented fiction novel that was set in like the frozen north backwoods Maine, and it, it was amazing. And it was interactive fiction. You could go around the 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 virtual village that she created, although she was actually taking photos of actual people and this that blew my mind and I think it's really at the same the same place where you're you know where your comment points to of like looking at how we use different ideas and begin to integrate them because um, they can come from anywhere and once we start once we start thinking outside the box you know that nice red box or blue box <laughs> or whatever box you started in um, once we start getting Further and further from that, and further and further from like the hardcore number crunchers that Andrew was mentioning earlier, it starts to be huge. Like, okay, what do we have that we can bring from playground games, children's playground games? What what's there that's interesting for a game designer now? What's in um, short films? What's in uh, video game technology right now? Like, it's so much cool stuff. It's very exciting. <laughs> I'm very excited. I yeah. my hands <laughs> well, and, and, and and the the fact that uh, let let's face it that that uh, the vast majority of people now have access to smartphones with apps mm -hmm. that 
those things are both useful and, as opposed to, say, tablets or laptops, relatively non-intrusive. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's that's something that conceivably could be harnessed. You know, though, uh, my friend Gene was here and watching him reset his dice roller uh, in a storyteller <laughs> game every every roll uh, was where it took him a minute to do it each time. Just Maybe a little dice, skeptical. Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he refused for the entire session, but yeah. Uh, um, well, let me let me ask you guys this this question then, because it does point to uh, looking at publishers and looking at companies. What would you say publishers, companies uh, need to be doing or not doing to to, to take advantage uh, or to avoid the, the the perils of this this new new digital age? Um, and I'm going to I'm going to hit you with that one, Andrew, to start. Even just one thing. Oh boy, um, man, that's that's a tough one. Publishers that should be what publishers should be doing or shouldn't be doing, huh? Um, I would. I'll say, start. I'll start with one. I'm going to start with one and give you a second here. All right. If you have people working on Twitter, social media, Facebook, or communicating at all with customers, <laughs> <laughs> you need to train them in professional etiquette, and and I mean that in the nicest possible way. That they they need to be aware that any communications that they give to any customer have the potential to get out there into the blogosphere, and that uh, that that basic customer service things. Because I, uh, over this last year, I have been stunned at the kinds of of responses that that I just go, why in why in anyone's name would you have would you say that uh, to a potential customer um, who, who you're sending an email to? It's it's recorded. It's permanent. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that game companies need to, to need to recognize that and recognize their behavior. Um, I, I've uh, uh, it, it is a set of people who maybe have not worked in a professional field. Uh, I spent a number of years as an, an editor, and there were certain ways that you interacted with with clients. Uh, in the creative side of things, and there were certain ways you interacted with the, the public that that demonstrated your professionalism. That uh, a couple of times I've been like, "Whoa, I, I don't think I think I would have gotten fired if I had ever done that to to someone." Um, uh, it, and I think it's because there's a perception of it of it kind of being a hobby and a fun thing, and well, you know, uh, uh, or just just a lack of experience. Uh, so that would be my my digital age is recognizing that any communication go is not to that person but is to every single one of your potential customers. Yeah, my, right. Mine is probably actually almost a corollary to yours I think and that is do not make a promise that you can't keep like oh, do, God, don't, yes. set, don't set a hard deadline and then and then you know like promise something by a certain time and then just let it disappear into the ether. I mean yeah you, you can Things come up and you have good explanations, you know, sometimes. But you have to remember that once you put something down on the internet, it is there and it's going to be talked about by everybody that has anything to do with your game. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I for one, my product isn't out yet. It's not due till May of 2014. And if if it isn't out by May of 2014, I'm going to deserve whatever flack I get because that's when I said it's going to be available. And I expect <laughs> that from other people. If you say your game yeah. is going to be released on a certain date, make sure it is out by then. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess you know don't don't set yeah. unrealistic don't set unrealistic goals for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. I would say uh, that you, as a game designer in the modern world, which contains all the social media outlets, you disregard that potential to your detriment. Um, that. Games that I'm designing going forward, I am thinking of that component. Uh, I will definitely still be designing games like Thousand One Nights, which you know, good luck playing that over G Plus. I'd <laughs> love to see if it worked. It'll be awesome if it works, great. Um, but it's it's exciting, and as a game designer, I want to be designing games that excite me. That I'm that are interesting to me from a creative angle. And if I am still designing 
games that predate social media or games that could comfortably sit there ignorant of social media I'm not designing at the edge um, and I think that that is as a game designer where it's best to be where it's most exciting to be where you're actually saying something as opposed to not <laughs> so that's the biggest thing for me I, I think that I would say for a game designer to look at and also uh, and sort of the flip side of, of this and also of, of what um, Andrew and Laura said that sometimes you do have to be private and you have to recognize when you are the public face of your game design company or your business or when you are doing your job being that public face if you're a bigger organization um, and that's cool but then you also have to recognize when you are saying something and you're having a, a, a semi-private discussion if it's on the internet it is not entirely private we know that but it is okay to be having a conversation on your blog or in your G plus stream or in you know, whatever to say here's a conversation I'm having with this person and this is what we're having and then someone else sometime in the future is going to misconstrue that they're going to take you out of context they're going to say oh, you said this thing and it sucks when that happens it's going to happen don't get out don't don't get bent out of shape about it stay courteous about it huh. don't run around trying to correct people on the internet because you're gonna do it all day it's ridiculous <laughs> But when you wind up in a position where you're directly asked, correct them. It's okay. You know? So that, that's the, the part about definitely be conscious that you're public, but also be aware that you still exist as a person, and you still get to play games offline, and you still get to have all that space as well. Yeah. Steve? Uh, I'd say uh, publishers should try to meet their public where they live and mm. what I mean by that is um, how they're using your product um, the first sort of digital products that we had were PDFs basically uh, pre-print uh, versions that were made for the printed page uh, so they were they're static uh, they're inflexible they they provide perfect photo replica of what the designer wanted but doesn't necessarily work on all devices mm -hmm. so something like EPUBs or or Mobi versions uh, so that they actually flow the text flows and fits the person's device um, would be a way to go I I oftentimes see publishers put out their product and then a flood of customers saying well where's the EPUB version of this mm -hmm. or, or just a, a, a no art plain text version that they can use mm -hmm. so so it, it does take more work it takes more effort but that's what the public wants mm -hmm. <sighs> sometimes it's like oh god I would love to do that can yeah. you give me another five hours in a day <laughs> right exactly <laughs> exactly it's it's very oh. tough and, and yeah it's true. Yeah. It, it takes up more more time. It takes up more design time, uh, uh, the personal time, like you say, of the of the designer of the lab. Well, I'm I'm also a little surprised we're not seeing more companies with a kind of dedicated on. I mean, this and I'm talking about bigger companies now mm -hmm. with a kind of a dedicated online presence and a dedicated online convention team. It would seem to me, I mean, I, uh, I know conventions are a losing proposition for a, a lot of companies. They, they are pricey. Uh, unless you have a good product that you can, can move, uh, of, of, oftentimes won't subvent it. There's travel times, hotel expenses, and so on. Um, it is, it is a, a marketing tool. Um, it would seem to me that you could crowdsource and be really harnessing that and and doing demo games online but that means having the tools and having a game that can be can be played easily online with the existing tools uh, I'll give you for example I'm a big advocate for Hill Folk uh, Robin Law's drama system I think it's a brilliant brilliant system I'm looking forward to to playing it I've, I have the stuff I I wrote my review of it when the Kickstarter was going on um, my wife is terrified of it because um, <laughs> uh, it'll put her on this this the spot um, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to it but 
the problem is there are a set of mechanics in there that I'm not sure how you do those online because mm -hmm. there's there's cards and there's tokens and there's different kinds of tokens and uh, 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 Pelgrane uh, I think could benefit from having someone sit down again if we could have you know you know another forty hour week for somebody um, right. to develop a set of tools that could be easily used for that and I I mm -hmm. think companies going forward need to be thinking about that. Uh, as you say, prepared for that uh, ahead of time. Even if they're doing a traditional game, they have to 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 mm -hmm. think about how they can can harness that that power. Well, and you said it uh, at the beginning of of your comment. There is to crowdsource it. You know, find your your evangelists in your in your yeah. fans, and uh, and they're going to go through the effort anyway. So that that might be an area that uh, that companies could look at mm -hmm. uh, having some kind of um, team of of dedicated fans to to work on those projects. I bought Thirteenth Age because Aaron R did a demo game. He was doing pickup games, demo games of it online, and I played it. and I had a, a ton of fun, and I loved the the way the character sheet looked. And that was really my side of the interaction. Didn't see anything else in the system, just the character sheet, mm -hmm. and the play was fun. And I was like, I'm going to buy this, and and I did, and and it was it was purely based on on that experience. Sure. Uh, so I'm going to ask you guys for uh, last words here, as we're almost at the the end of our hour. Um, uh, so uh, let me let me start with I'm going to go sort of left to right, and I'll hit you with that, Andrew. Um, yeah, I just I probably would just say that the digital age is definitely. Um, making things a lot more interesting in the role-playing community, and uh, while it's not quite in its infancy stages, I would say it's probably not quite out of its terrible twos yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's about good. Yeah. Uh, I guess my 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 last thought is going to be, I hope that at some point uh, there's a reader or a way uh, that gets me to be as comfortable using PDFs or electronic versions of rule books as as hardcovers. Um, mm -hmm. Because certainly I've, I've bought all of the bundles of holding and all of those things and I've read maybe 1% uh, of all yeah. the things that I, I've bought online. Um, and I wish I could I wish I could get past that um, uh, uh, that, that, that having the printed copy works so much better for me. Uh, uh, Megay? Well, the printed word's been around a lot longer. It's a very, very good reason for the the difficult shift. You know, we're the first people that are dealing with this new technology. It's not not a big deal. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest and most interesting things about new ways of getting your game out there and new uh, digital media tools that we can use for that, ways to reach our audience, ways to um, put uh, our ideas in front of people, um, ways to connect with people who want to play our games, is that it opens up doors for people who had not been able to play or design or publish before. And this is huge because this means we will hear a much wider variety of design voices um, we will have an opportunity to play with more people from different backgrounds, different countries, different places, um, and that can only be good for the hobby as a whole. Absolutely, mm -hmm. awesome, Steve. You're, uh, you're one of my players. So I'm going to give you last word there. <laughs> okay. Well, I was trying to think of what the next big thing will be, and I started thinking about how gamers sort of co-op and take over existing technology. So mm -hmm. you have discussion forums, they became used for play by post. Mm -hmm. um, G, G plus hangouts, not necessarily for gaming, but they've been taken over and are hugely popular for gaming purposes. So I was trying to think what the next big thing would be. And my thought is it, it, it probably won't be something that's designed specifically for gamers. It will be mm -hmm. some other some other technology. It will be some other idea that um, isn't Gaming isn't on, on the radar for that, but gamers will see it, start using it, and it will take over, uh, just the same way some of these other technologies have. Uh, and it goes back to the communication uh, 
there. Awesome. Uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for being a part of this conversation, um, which was in, in, interesting for me. I, I, I think we are in, in undiscovered wild countries. Um, <laughs> and, uh, That's true. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, for, for, for a 40-something a uh, 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 trying to figure out how to navigate this, it, it, is, it is pretty cool. Um, yeah. uh, thanks to Andrew Gunner uh, and uh, to McGay Baker um, and uh, to Steve Sigety um, uh, for your participation in this. And uh, I'm going to wrap up the, the broadcast and uh, this will be available on YouTube and I'll be sharing it to the VirtuaCon uh, uh, threads. Excellent. Enjoy all right. the thanks all. Yeah. Thanks Thank all. Thank you very much. <laughs>